have a chance to go? Good. How, how was that for you? Okay. Does anybody, does, do you see how, how you can use this? Pretty simple. Okay. So when you're, how many of you guys have ever come back, uh, have gone to work and people start telling you what they did that weekend and you really don't want to hear it? <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I understand. So sometimes people will tell you about stuff that you don't want to hear. Other times people talk, go on and on and on. That's why I'm trying to help you to understand uh, to, be, to be concise, to be the, to the point, but to have a purpose. There are power in your words. And the one who understands the power of words makes use of it, is what Proverbs says. So we need to understand that being able to communicate is part of being a minister of reconciliation. Amen? Amen. So that's one way that you can begin to do that, to begin to shift the story, to, to shift the conversation. Two main tools. One is asking people, uh, can I pray for you? Right? If God were to do a miracle in your life, what would it be? I'd like to pray for you. And that, op that shifts things that direction. Another thing that shifts things that direction, you know, you might pick up a nap, you know, somebody drops something, you pick that up, and they say, oh, you're so nice. You know, you say, well, you know, I love to do this, but there was a time in my life when I was a really angry person. I hated people, but Jesus changed me. And since then, He's given me a love. How about you? You know, sometimes people will ask me uh, the things like, you know, how are you doing today? I'll say, a lot better than I should be. <laughs> And they'll go, what do you mean? <laughs> there was a time in my life when, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, there, and, and you'll find that this is a very, very practical way to communicate because it helps you to be able to shift conversations. Sometimes it's not necessarily about, uh, about Jesus, it's about the Holy Spirit, right? Sometimes people are like, you know, I don't know about any of that miracle stuff. Well, there was a time in my life when I had that same uh, conviction. I thought all oh, everybody's just trying to play tricks on people and get money and, and that kind of thing. But, but then I saw in the Word of God that Jesus said, Whoever believes in me, the works I do, he will do also. And as I began to be a believer like that, I began to see miracles. I've seen, a th I've seen thousands of miracles, and I've actually seen other people begin to do, to, to, uh, to do miracles as well. So this, can, this sort of communication can be very powerful, and I'm trying to help, help you all with that for that specific reason, because you are close to people that are far from God, and you being equipped as a minister of reconciliation, as an ambassador of Christ, God's got something to say. God's got something to do. But if He's going to do it and say it, He's going to say it and do it through you. Amen? So, one part of this that we, you know, that's training. And if you're only training, you're only going to get what training can do. But God can do more than any kind of training. Amen? That's why this all starts off with, in Luke chapter 10, verse 2, Jesus says to them, Pray that the Lord of the harvest would send out workers into the harvest. I don't believe this just means pray and ask God to send other people. <laughs> He's telling them, pray so that God can send you out as workers into the harvest. Because people who are, people to be, to be able to be a, an ongoing effective minister in the harvest, you've got to be filled. You've got to be, uh, you've got to have something from God going on that's so strong and so powerful and so real that it enables you to have purpose, to have vision, to have courage, to see people differently and to see yourself differently and to see this world as something more than just a bunch of troubles and problems that you're trying to avoid, just kind of slip on by and just, you know, keep things nice and easy and not make any trouble. But you're, you've got you realize that God is the Lord of the harvest. He is absolutely reigning and ruling over all of it. That wherever you go, God says, I own that place. Amen? And that those people that you see, any of y'all come from a farming community? 
<laughs> Maybe not any, huh? Now, you did? You from, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Only thing people grow on the south side of Chicago is weed in their basement. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> and, yeah, no, I got it. All right, listen. So you understand that to a farmer, that the, that, that the harvest, that's precious. That's precious. That's, that's what they've been doing. All, everything is for the harvest. So there is a, there's a value that God has for the world that we only get by absorbing His heart in prayer. Do you understand that? Pray so that the Lord can send you out. Send out workers into His harvest. Pray for other people. Pray for yourself. Spend time in God's presence recognizing Him as the Lord of the harvest. He, he's not just Lord. He's Lord of something. He's got value for the world. He's got passion for this world. So much so that He sent His own Son. Now, Jesus Christ in Luke chapter 15, He is having supper with Matthew and, and people that had been come there, and, and there was prostitutes at that party. Now, Matthew was the kind of guy that when he had a party, and he started letting the word out to his friends, hey, I'm having a banquet at my house, y'all come. Some of his friends were like, well, who's bringing the prostitutes? Who's bringing the hookers? You know, that's, that's the kind of person that Matthew was. And Jesus is having supper there. He's hanging out. And the Pharisees, they're giving the disciples a bunch of grief, saying, look, you know, we've been wondering what's going on with Jesus, but we've been trying to make these people feel ashamed of themselves. They're, you know, so we've been rejecting them. What's He doing? Eating and drinking with sinners. Holy men don't do that. Jesus gave them some stories, but before I do that, I want you to understand something. Sometimes uh, we have to shift things. I remember uh, hearing from one, uh, one brother, he came back and he began to train uh, people in the church because he was a missionary. And he came back and said, he sat in the church for a couple of weeks and he said, Pastor, can I do things here, the things here that I've been doing overseas? He was in Booger Holler, North Carolina. This is where all the moonshiners live and stuff. And so he, he, started, he started going to the lost, and he started having a relationship with them. He'd, he'd go around prayer walking, but he'd interact with people. He, so as he saw people, he'd walk to them and said, Hey, I'm praying for the community today. What kind of miracle do you need? I'd love to pray for you. Start a conversation with them. Then he began to, to find who's interested and began to start new groups and things like that. And the pastor was like, could you teach our leaders to do this? And he taught them one lesson. They came back to the Waffle House the next uh, day, the next time they were to meet. And, okay, who did what they said they were going to do? And nobody did anything. Okay, well, we'll just go back over that lesson again. Right? Come back the next time. Nobody did. After the third time, they said, like, you guys keep setting these goals. Like, I'm going to share my testimony with some lost people, but nobody's talking to any lost people. And what's going on, you know? And one of them sitting, the pastor's in the group, right? And the, uh, the church leader's in the group. And he said, it's just taken me some time. My whole life I've been told to stay away from these kind of people. Now you're telling me I need to go to them and speak to them. And it's taken me some time to, to adjust. Do you understand? Mindsets. Yeah, mindsets. Now, we understand that Jesus was amongst sinners calling as a righteous one, calling them to repentance. But listen to how He called repent people to repentance. How does God treat sinners? You know, He, he stands on a street corner with a big old sign, a bullhorn, telling them they're going to go to hell. And it makes a big list of all the things they're doing wrong, doesn't he? You know, when, when a farmer goes to the harvest, you know, they make a big sign and say, Get in the barn or you're going to burn! <laughs> That's what they do? That's not what they do, do they? They work. They bring it in. When Jesus said, Why is he eating and drinking amongst sinners? What did he do? He told three stories. He said, 
there was a shepherd who had lost one sheep. He left the 99, went to go find the one. When he found it, what did he do? Gathered in his arms and he did what? Rejoiced, didn't he? Brought it home, celebrated. There was a woman who had ten silver coins. She lost one. What did she do? Cleaned the whole house. <laughs> she found a silver coin. Then what did she do? She threw a party. Father had two sons. One of them treated him very rudely. Took, took his share of the inheritance. Took off. Squandered the inheritance. Started to come back. Thinking, you know, there's a famine. I need to go home. My father's servants do but Even my father's slaves are better off than I am. I'll just go home and be a slave. Well, guess what? He starts in and the father runs to him. And I found out why that happened. Okay? When I was in Uganda about seven or eight years ago now, I was in a van. And we were driving into the town, into the city, and all of a sudden there was a man naked as a jaybird running past the car, and there was a big commotion, and people were yelling at him. I was like, what is that? I mean, I was like a streaker in Uganda? I mean, because that's a very conservative society. I was like, what is that? And our host pastor, he leaned over his seat. He said, that man was probably a thief. They caught him. So they strip him naked and they make him run back to his, his home naked. And anyone knows that as that he's running, they yell at him, shame on you, thief, shame on you, thief, so that he'll never do that again. Well, <laughs> that's one way to handle it, right? Well, in the Jewish society at that time, if a child were to treat a, a family shamefully like this, that to, so, to show solidarity with the, the family that stayed, to show, you know, you shouldn't have shamed them, right? They, what people would do is that they would get their, um, they would get earthenware jars and they would, they would smash them at the feet of the people that were coming back as kind of a way to say, you know, shame on you. You know, I'm sure some of the, the stuff would cut up their feet, you know, like making it unwelcome for them to come here. So, and it was expected maybe the mom could go out and, and greet them, but the father was just to sit there and let them kind of beg on their hands and knees kind of thing. So that's what the father knew the arrangement was. That was what the expectation. He's running to the son to be the first one there, to say no shame. In fact, then he lifts up his voice and he calls for his servants and says, bring the best robe, put it on my son. So this is Jesus, God in the flesh, eating with sinners, telling these stories. And then he goes on. Then he goes, then the older brother, he didn't want to go into this party. He had to celebrate the brother's return after he did all this. He said, look, I, I did everything you ever wanted me to. But see, the younger son, he didn't know the father's heart, so he left home. Now he's getting to know the father's heart. I just, he didn't say, I'm so glad you're back. Now I can build the barn. Get out to work. Let's have a party. I don't want your work. I want you. Amen? <laughs> I want you. And now the older son is like, you know, I, I've just been doing everything you've told me to. You never do anything for me. And Jesus had to shift that, didn't he? Don't you know everything I have is yours? It belongs to you. So to the religious and to the prodigal, both of them have to come into the grace, knowing the Father's heart. But how is he going to do that? How is the Father going to show his heart? There are people out in the harvest that think, to come to God means I have to be his slave. I just have to do all this stuff he wants me to do. Go to church and do it. Man, I like my life the way it is. Catch him a few months later. 
man, I'm out of money. You know, I'm addicted. And how's that working for you? <laughs> right? I mean, not, not laughing over them, but inviting them home. The Father wants you as a son. You know, the guy said, Father, you know, I've sinned against heaven. I'm no longer worthy. I just accept me as a slave. There's so many people that even as believers, they think they've come back to the Father as a slave. There's a whole religion out there that's just about slavery. We just do the will of Allah. It's just about slavery. But God isn't about slavery. He's about making us sons. Sons. Not just not just uh, doing, robots doing His will, slaves doing His will. You're not in the home. You know, if a, if a slave's in the home on the basis of work, right? You know, we had chickens for a while. We had built a chicken coop in the back. Then the winter came and they started molting. They stopped laying eggs. When, as soon as the snow melts, I'm like, get these chickens out of here. I'm feeding them. They're not feeding me because when they molt, they don't, they don't, they don't lay eggs. Like, this is not the arrangement, you know? If I'm going to feed you, you're going to feed me, one way or the other. <laughs> and we, uh, but my children, it doesn't matter, you know? If happy days, sad days, healthy days, sick days, they're in my house and they're there to stay. Why? Wow, they're mine. They're mine. But chickens... <laughs> But we didn't, we didn't get adopted into a foster care system where God's still trying to make up His mind about us, whether we get to stay or not. He welcomes us as sons, as daughters. He gives us the very same relationship with Him that Jesus has and gives us that very same Spirit. Amen? So, my encouragement to you all is to begin to ask God, who are the people that I know in my life, that are in my circle, that um, don't know you or are far from you? And who can I begin to pray for, pray for on a regular basis? And who can I begin to, to go to in your name? Amen? Why don't you take a few minutes? You, there's little notebooks, notepads in there. Just take some time with the Lord. Make a list of some of the people that you know and ask God to begin to give you a strategy. Some people you know. They don't want you coming around. Well, that might not be the best place to start. <laughs> Amen? But there's other people. God's got them on His heart. You're close to them. He wants to get close to them. You're the plan. So let me shut up for a little bit. Good. As you, um, as you make the list, ask the Lord to show you who to start with. And just maybe circle or put a little asterisk around a couple people. And what it is, how you can start. Good. Um, now, at your tables, just um, maybe get in little pods of twos or threes. Maybe share a couple of, uh, of the things that are on your heart with those people and pray for one another. Pray for, pray for those people. Pray for one another that God would give you um, success in the things that are on your heart. Um, and then we'll, uh, that, that will be the next thing, because 
those, those things, those people, those are the things that I encourage people to do. Is that sometimes we, we, we leave everything up to God and He's committed the ministry of reconciliation to us. He wants to partner with us, doesn't He? But He has to have partners that are... And the way that we partner with God is in prayer, it's listening to the Holy Spirit, and then being obedient to what He tells us to do. Amen? So why don't you take some time to share with one another what God has laid on your heart uh, so that you can join and agree with one another uh, in prayer for those people and those plans that God has laid. So maybe divide up into groups of twos and threes so maybe uh, it doesn't take too long. Yeah, Father, thank You so much that You hear our prayer. Thank You, Father, that You um, use us, that You work in us. I thank You that You have given us testimonies to share, to give You praise and glory, and to help other people see how You can change their life um, because You've changed us. We thank You for the Holy Spirit, God. Thank You that You empower us and that You work in us um, as we step out, that You flow through us, that You guide our words, You guide our thoughts. Father, that you have um, laid specific people on our hearts, that you've shown us where to start and what to do, and so we ask for open doors, divine appointments, and that you would be preparing our hearts and continue just to um, prepare us so that we can be um, your ministers, your ambassadors, that we can bring your message to and go be your uh, hands and feet to run to lost sons, to find lost sheep, to go search and to bring in the harvest, God. Thank you for your heart. Help us to have it, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So, tonight we kind of covered uh, a lot of different things. Little, it's almost like putting recipe, uh, different different ingredients together. We haven't made anything. No cakes. No nothing like that yet. However. Tomorrow, we will come together and we'll start to put this together so that you can see how um, you've got a lot of different tools. Um, and we'll work on some more tools. We're going to work on, uh, we're going to talk about um, prophecy, hearing from God. Uh, we'll talk about different aspects of uh, being able to lead people to Christ, share the gospel. Um, but then what do you do with them, right? And how do you, how, how are you able to uh, go from being a, faithful attender to being able to work together to actually bring the kingdom of God and launch new moves of God in, new, in, com, in your communities for people who right now darkening the door of the church is not on their mindset. You understand that? Um, and so um, I'm really excited about that. Um, and so thank you very much. I, I know this has been kind of a you know, shotgun night, uh, and uh, I hope it hasn't been too tiring or exhausting. Did you guys get anything out of this evening? Was this good? Okay, okay, very good. Well, God bless.